Welcome to the Real Church Podcast. You can learn more about Real Church online at realchurch.today. Now here's today's message. We are talking about this month. I, I'm loving this, by the way, that we're not just having a Resurrection Sunday. We're having a Resurrection Month. And I've never done this before, and I'm, I'm very excited about it. I've been excited about being in this topic because, uh, as I told you a couple of weeks ago, as I first looked at this, I was like, oh, my goodness, we talk about this one time a year, and we don't exhaust it. And uh, I don't know that I'm going to exhaust it in a month, but, but uh, it's sure been good to try. And so I want to talk to you today. We're carrying on this theme of the resurrection of the dead. And uh, I'm trying to... I'm trying to teach somebody in my family right now that's not really old enough to grasp it all that death, can y'all just get this with me? If we don't get nothing else this morning, let's just get this one thing. Death is not final. Death is not final. You are an eternal being. You're going to live forever. Now, there's, I know there's people still seeking immortality somewhere there. You know, I've watched Troy, you know. Come on, immortality's before you take it. It's yours. Uh, you've already got it. You don't have to go drink no water out of some certain cup to get it. We are created to live forever. That is not the question. The question is where? (laughs) Where are we going to spend our eternity? So I want you to know that death is not final. Death is a doorway to eternity. We step out of this mortal body, and Paul said we take on the immortal. So I'm not making anything up here. I mean, I I hope this don't sound, if this sounds strange to you, it's just because we don't talk about it. But you are an immortal being. You're going to do something that Superman can't do. He's he's fictitious. You're not. You're going to live forever. Oh, it's got quiet. Y'all are looking at me like, really? Oh, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So pick your neighbors wisely. (laughs) We bought our place in Tarkenton, and the people we bought it from uh, the man that lived at our house in Tarkenton before us had built the house. He was 93 years old when he passed away. He had six or seven children, something like that. And uh, they were all fussing over his estate. And God used that situation to open the door for us. I had no idea. In the brief meeting we had with his son who lived next door, I had no idea that they were going to become some of the best neighbors we ever had in our lives. Just the sweetest, most wonderful people. Uh, Equally, (laughs) we've we've lived some other places where our neighbors weren't so great. But our eternity, you might all think about it, (laughs) because this neighbor is going to be there forever and ever and ever. You better be careful which place you, you choose to live. Amen? Yeah. Woo! So, we're talking about the resurrection of the dead. And so, I don't want you to be like a child and be afraid of dying. Dying is a passageway. It is a doorway to the eternal. And so, uh, the resurrection of the dead is something that has to be at the root of of our doctrinal positions as Christians. If, it's, if, we, if there is no resurrection of the dead, then what is life? What, what, is, it, what is the purpose? What, how did this happen? Maybe we really did come from a pool of green goo somewhere in the space. No, no. There is a purpose. We've been created to be God's children and to live with him forever and so we shouldn't fear it we should just understand that we don't control it so you don't ever want to give the thought well i'll just go ahead and end it all because i'm gonna go to heaven well no that's not how this works god's in control 
And God has, at least he's in control of our life, uh, of our distance of our life. And the Bible says our days are numbered by the Lord. When your number's up, it's going to be time to go spend eternity with him. And so he, he's going to determine our, that transition time, but we don't need to fear it. Amen? Amen? Enough of that. Resurrection of the dead. I want to talk to you today specifically about the rebirth of the dream. And I want you to turn with me to a portion of Scripture, and I'm going to try to show you something that maybe, <clears throat> maybe you haven't seen in it before because it's something I hadn't seen before, and the Lord just birthed it in me this week. And I'm looking in 2 Kings, and I'm in chapter 6. It says, The sons of the prophets said unto Elisha, Behold now, the place where we dwell with thee is too straight for us, or too small. Say this with me, too small. It's not enough. Not enough room. So he said, let us go, we pray thee, unto Jordan, and take thence every man a beam, and let us make us a place there where we may dwell. And he answered, go ye. And one said, be content, I pray thee, and go with your servants. And he answered and said, I will go. So he went with them, and when they came to Jordan, they cut down wood or trees. But as one was felling a beam, the axe head fell into the water, and he shouted or cried and said, Alas, master, for it was borrowed. And the man of God said, Where fell it? And he showed him the place, and he cut down a stick. He cast it in thither, and the iron did swim. Say this with me. The axe head swam. Think about that for a minute. Don't even have no hands or feet. And the axe head was swimming. <whistles> Therefore said he, take it up to thee, and, put, and, he, and, and he put out his hand, and he took it. So here's the story. The sons of the prophets, these are... This is the prophet's, in, in, in modern terms, this would be called the prophet's guild. This is the training place for would-be prophets, you know, young men that are learning the ministry. And, uh, and so they said, look, there's so many of us, this place we're in, it's a little small, it's time to build a bigger place, and, uh, and we think that we should just go and find a place, and the prophet of the Lord says, I'm with you. I mean, there's so much in this, so I'm going to just give you some little glips and glurps this morning. Uh, it, I, if you've got something that the Lord is birthing in your heart, share it with somebody who's going to encourage you. Yeah. Don't, don't share. If you've got a naysayer in your life, just keep it to yourself. Right. Don't even tell them. Because they're not going to help you. They're not going to speak words of blessing over you and encouragement. Man, I want somebody around me that's going to say, you can do it. I, yeah, I, I don't know if I've made this clear enough to y'all, but I, I was not a good, I was, I was not a great athlete growing up. I was good at a few things. I was never really great at anything. And, but I'll, I'll tell you, it, it, my daddy uh, had, had, it's kind of weird. My dad, he was very vocal. Uh, he's very loud, uh, loudest guy at the baseball park. Um, uh, my dad was, had always had a struggle of controlling what he said. But he had an understanding at some point in his life, growing into a, his Christianity, that, that what I said was important. And so, although my dad probably said some things he wished he never said, my dad was a great encourager to me when it came to athletics. My dad was a natural athlete. I was not a natural athlete. I know I look like it, but I wasn't. <laughs> Shut up, Blake. And... Uh, so my dad, who could just, you could just say some, some sport, and my dad just elevated to the top of it. He just was that guy. I wasn't. And my dad probably knew that from the very beginning, but my dad, when it came to sports, always told me how great I was at it, how much I could succeed at it, how I was as good as anybody on the field. Now, you could say that's just a doting father uh, speaking something that's not reality. But isn't that what the Bible says to do? To speak about those things as if they're not, as, as if they are when they're not? 
And so my dad always encouraged me, and, and there were moments, you've heard me tell it, I, I, where I'm, I'm facing a pitcher that I just, in my mind, there's just no way I can't hit this guy. I remember the, the first boy that I ever faced that could throw a real curveball scared me to death. And I remember everybody in the dugout talked about it. I mean, this guy, he's unhittable. He's just, his curveball is unhittable. Well, let me tell you something. When a 13-year-old boy starts throwing a curveball, you need to be scared because they don't control it very well. I mean, it, sometimes it's a strike. A lot of times it's hitting you in the head because they, they lose control of it. And so he was, yeah, he could strike you out, but he was scary. And I think that fear got in my heart. And I, 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 first two times I faced him, just three swings, and I was out. And, and I remember my dad, every time, going back to the dugout, this is why I do this to Micah, I, if I can. Sometimes I can't. But if I can stand there by the fence when he goes by, even if he strikes out, we're all saying, good job, baby. Good try. Good swing. You got this, boy. You got this machine. I always tell him, it was the pitcher. The pitcher wasn't very good, and that is a fact, because that machine to throw him low or high or whatever. And uh, I'll say, your daddy threw you one high. He just needs to fix the machine. And, uh, but I try to tell him, you know, it's, you, you got this. It's good. You got it. And my dad would say, hey, 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 don't you lower your face. You keep your head up, and you go back out there. You got this guy. And I remember thinking, yeah, well, you're not the one up there worried about getting beamed. You know, it's not as easy as all that. But it's the truth. His words encourage me. You need to be with people who, when you have something that God has birthed in your heart, if you're going to share it, don't share it with the gossip club. Don't share it with the naysayers. Share it with people of faith who are going to look you in the face and say, you got this, man. You got this. Yes. So they said, we're going to do it. And the prophet said, we're going to do it. Let's do it. And so... You know, I, I had a pastor years ago say that. He said, look, if somebody walks in here in my office and they say, we need to do something, I say, yes, let's do it. <laughs> Get after it. Yeah. We went to Tommy Barnett's conference, and he said, hey, we have 250 working ministries in this church because people, get, I have the reputation that if you want somebody to encourage you and support you, you're going to find that in Tommy Barnett. And uh, he, he shared a story, and the guy shared his testimony, he brought this guy out, and he brought his ministry with him. He, was, he started a homeless ministry in Phoenix, and uh, I'll tell you how it started. He was living in Houston, and God spoke to his heart, and he said, I want you to go to Phoenix, Arizona, and start a homeless ministry. He said, but Lord, I don't know anybody there. The Lord said, don't worry, I'm going to provide for you. Just go. And so him and his wife sold their stuff, and they show up in Phoenix, Arizona. This is a Texan through and through. He's uh, about 60 years old, wearing a big old wide cowboy hat and cowboy boots, and he goes to Phoenix. And so he said, well, my first thought when I got there was, we've never done this. We don't know how to do it. And so we got we to gotta get a part of a church. And so he said, we started to go to churches, and we went to this church and that church. And he said, everywhere we went, I would, I would meet the pastor after the service and say, hey, my name's so-and-so, it's my wife, and we've been called by God to do this ministry, blah, 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 and we're looking for a home church. He said, after about 10 or 15 churches that we went to and got zero response from the pastors, he said, I was at my wit's end. He says, matter of fact, I was mad. And he said, we got up one Sunday morning, and the Lord said, go to First Assembly of God. And he said, my thought was, oh, yeah, I'm going to go to this big church. This pastor ain't going to give me the time of day. He said, but we'll go. So we went, and he said, I, I'll be honest, I didn't really pay much attention to the church service. I just wanted to talk to that preacher after. And he said, when, that, when Tommy Barnett was finished preaching that morning, he said, I walked through that 10,000 people crowd, and I got down to the front where he was, and I waited my turn to speak to him. And he said, I shook his hand, and this is what I said to him. He said, this is word for word. He said, my name is... Charles something. He said, God called me to Phoenix to start a homeless ministry, and my wife and I are here to do it, and I want to know what you're going to do about it. Tommy Barnett says, what I'm going to do about it is I'm going to support you in any way you need it. What do you need this morning? He said, I knew right then I was in the right place. Today, he ministers to over 350 
people in one service underneath a bridge in Phoenix, Arizona with, a, with his wife. They got a big old bus. His wife cooks breakfast in it. They feed him. He preaches and sings. And, um, uh, you know, he just needed somebody that would agree with what God was speaking in him and speak over him and encourage him and do what they could do to help him. And the prophet said, let's do it. We can do it. Amen. And so they went, and they began, and uh, they were doing the work. The, the axe head has great importance in this story that we don't really know much about, but in their culture, an axe head was a very expensive tool to have. No one in the uh, preacher's guild had one, so they borrowed one. When you borrow something expensive, I don't know about y'all, I, I haven't borrowed anything in a long time because my daddy taught me if you've got to borrow it, you better be ready to buy it right? Because most probably it's going to break. It's just how it goes. And you're going to have to replace it. And so, you know, don't borrow it if you can't afford it. And so my daddy taught me, you just need to go find you one and buy it and go to the pawn shop if you need to, but you know, don't, don't borrow. And, uh, but they borrowed it. And, uh, and you know, it, it just, he's just out there swinging. And you, if you ever swung an ax, you know, sometimes the ax head falls off or it breaks and off the handle breaks and off it went into the middle of the water. <laughs> man listen when your dream dies you need somebody that's still going to stand there and encourage you and believe with you if y'all want to know why i love greg thurston so much every time i talk to him he speaks encouraging words over you and me and our church and that means the world to me <laughs> and so they said oh we got a problem. Let's go to the man of God. He's in charge of this preacher's association. Let's go to him. He's the big dog. Let's see what he wants to do about this lost, you know, expensive piece of equipment. And they said, we've lost the axe head. He said, where did it fall? They said, well, it splashed right out there. And the Bible just says he reaches over and gets a stick. And whew. imagine everybody watching said, do you need an illustration of where it fell in there? I mean, I know the water's calm now, but seriously, you don't throw a stick at it. But he must have been praying under his breath, huh? And he threw that stick in there, and then they saw something that you and I have never seen unless you watch cartoons. The axe head, I have watched the cartoon on VeggieTales, and, but anyway, the axe head sprouts some uh, fins, and that dude comes swimming up out of the water. Woo! Won't you, don't you wish you'd have been there? <laughs> That's what happens when people of faith have somebody that speaks faith over them because when you speak faith, God listens. And God says, you're talking about the impossible? You got me excited because you talk about the impossible. That gives me, a po that gives me the possibility of being God. <laughs> and so while they thought this is crazy, the man done talking, talking faith and throwing a stick at a water pond to get a, a metal axe head to come up off the bottom. And yes, ma'am. Yes, sir. It came up off the bottom and it swam and they got it back and and uh, they finished their building. Listen, sometimes the very thing that God has put in your hand to make your dream happen. Gets taken from you. They had a dream of a bigger building, but without that piece of equipment, they can't cut. They don't have chainsaws. They're not cutting down another tree. They're not going to put up another log. They're not going to build anything else until they get another one or get that one back. And sometimes when, when the thing that God has put in your hand to make the dream a reality, when it's lost, it's not time to give up. It's time to believe up. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> let, let me give you some phases of the dream. I got to move. We, we're going to run out of time and... They're going to shut the TV off and all that. There's phases to a dream. There's always the birth of the dream. That's the moment you see it and go, wow, I'd like to do that. Birth of the dream. I wish Zach was in here to hear this. Well, maybe he don't need to hear this. Yeah, he really don't need to hear this right now. Zach just got his driver's license, drove to church for the first time this morning. Thank you, Jesus, for protection. <laughs> thank you for patience and temperance and all that stuff. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. I got my license and didn't have 
a car. Well, it's a long story, but I was having to drive my mom's Pinto Squire station wagon. If you've never driven a yellow Pinto station wagon with the fake wood on the sides, you have not lived yet. Four-cylinder, automatic, so zero power. My brother, when he got to drive it years later, would pull the emergency brake on it and put the gas to the floor because it had one emergency brake in the back and it wasn't on the drive wheel, so it would stop with the emergency brake on and it wouldn't roll, but the wheel, would, he, he would hold the gas down until it finally, it would go, er, 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 and he would smoke the one time. Anyway, yeah, it's just crazy stuff. Mom didn't know that until after she was much older. But uh, that car didn't do much for our ego. <laughs> and so I done turned 16, I'm driving, and I don't have a car. And my dad said, when you get out of school this year, I got you a job waiting for you out at the plant. Well, you had to be 18 to work at the plant, but dad knew the guy in charge of maintenance and got me a job. And so at 16 years old, I was working an 18-year-old job, and I was making unreal money for a guy my age working out in the plant for the summer. I worked three months, saved up all of it, much as I could. And uh, at the end of the summer, he said, uh, I said, I'm going to buy me a car. So we shopped, and I found the love of my life, a 1973 Camaro. My mother's words to me were, yes, you can have it. You work for it, go get it. My dad's words, absolutely not. It's not going to be your first car. He was a police officer. Do you all understand? He said, that's bad news, going to get you in trouble. That was a prophetic word. That car got me in a lot of trouble, got me in fights. It got me almost killed. Several times it got me in jail. I mean, yeah, it was, uh, yeah. But, that, but when I saw that car, that was the car of my dreams. My mom was the one who said, you can do this. You can have it. Well, it was more than, it cost more than I had. I had saved enough money to buy a car, but not that one. And uh, so when we, we, long story short, I was $500 short. And my dad, my mom, which was a really cool story, talked my dad into loaning me the $500 that I needed to go ahead and purchase the car. And I bought it. But when I saw it, it wasn't what I wanted it to be. It was just the car I wanted. And within six months, I ripped that car down to the frame and just rebuilt the whole thing. It took me months. My dad was, it's a long story. But I got that car where I wanted. I sold that car because I made a choice. I'm, our, our first child was born. I'm not going to tell you which one it was because I don't want him to feel guilty that I had to get rid of my car. But I got rid of my car for him, and uh, it was a pretty good trade. And, and then as soon as I did it, I was like, I should have never got rid of it. I have that car again now, not the very one, but I've got another 73 Camaro. It's sitting in my shop, and I'm just going to tell you that the dream that I had then for it, I have a, I have a rebirth dream today for the one I have over there. I'm going to put the same girl in the passenger seat, though. So that, that's not changing. I'm going to change a few things about the car, how I do it this time, because I'm a little older and wiser. Hello. And, uh, and I'm gonna, it's going to be a little different, but I'm, I'm at work on it. It's going to happen. And it, it may have died for a while, 30-some-odd years that dream died, but it has been resurrected. And so what happens is there's always this excitement when you see it, and then there's the announcement of it, that's what I want, that's what I'm going to do. And then in this story, there was a building of synergy. You've got to build synergy with people who can buy into your dream and will help you and, and cultivate it and nurture it and, and whisper about it. That's what in the... Uh, uh, in, in, uh, in the, in the movie Gladiator, before the, the good king dies, he is, he is telling, he's telling uh, uh, Maximus, he's telling Maximus, there was a dream that was wrong, and it was so fragile, you could only whisper, and it would die. Listen, your dream will die if you share it with the wrong people. They'll start telling you, you don't have enough money, you don't have enough strength, you don't have enough ability. My, ch my grandchildren will never hear it off my lips that you're not tall enough or you're not strong enough or you're not fast enough or you don't have the ability. Right. Tell that to Jose Altuve. <laughs> you're too little. You're from a foreign country. You'll never make it. You don't even, you're not even a citizen. What? 
God over here, God, and everybody in the minor league said, you'll never make it. You're too little. You're not, you, you, no. Come on, y'all. Yeah. I don't know who was in his life in the other ear, but somebody was speaking to that boy telling him, you can do this. Yeah. You can do this. Nobody ever tells Spud Webb now that a five-foot, four-inch guy cannot dunk a basketball. I've got video. I've watched. It's, I watched him when he, was, when he came into the league as a rookie, and everybody's talking about it. And I was like, this kid ain't. What? Did he just, he just dunked a basketball. Made me feel white, I'll tell you that. I ain't never been able to. I, I can almost dunk one on an eight-foot goal. But anyway. <laughs> a ten-foot goal? Come on, y'all. Wow. So you build synergy. And then what follows that is the arrival of the roadblocks, the pitfalls, the opposition, the unexpected difficulties. Nobody expected we're going to lose the axe head in the middle of a pond, yeah. and which causes the loss of zeal and excitement and momentum and everything that you had going for you because now we had this unexpected roadblock. Y'all listening this morning? Yeah. You have these unexpected things that just happen in life and you didn't plan for it. You didn't. Hmm. I thought I had this all figured out. <laughs> and then if we're not careful, what follows that is we just forget about it. We just forget about it. Now, y'all are going to laugh about this, and that's okay. That's okay. I mean that. It's okay. I had a recurring nightmare for over 30 years, and this is the nightmare. It was always somebody coming to me saying, where's your car? And I'd say, my car's parked out. Y'all have to see my, where I grew up, but I'd park my car sometime beside our house because I didn't want it out by the road, and I would pull up in my parents' yard and park it beside the house, which was between a fence and the house, and it felt safer to me. And in my dream, I would always see my car parked in that spot, but somebody's telling me your car is gone, and I would go outside, and my car would be gone. And then that dream would go on, and I, or that nightmare would go on, and I would be looking for my car, and I had this feeling of loss, and I can't find it. I know it's an inanimate object, okay, don't, so don't judge me about this. Some of y'all love stuff, too. <laughs> and it's awful. This is awful. And I'd wake up and tell my wife, well, I dreamed about my car again tonight. It was awful. I didn't do it every night, but it would come up every few months or once a year, a couple times a year, I'd have this recurring nightmare. And it was always sad to me and heartbroken. And I always felt like helpless. I can't find it. It's gone. <laughs> and if you're not careful, when you have the unexpected opposition and the pitfalls and all that stuff, and you lose your excitement and zeal and you lose your focus on the dream, it can be forgotten. But God has a wonderful way of resurrecting the dreams in our life. <laughs> you know, and what, what happens is it is then brought to the forefront again. It's, it's like fresh and new in our heart again. It's called revived or renewed or reborn. <laughs> resurrected. Let me, let me give you three things real quick. For the resurrection to take place, you cannot see what everyone else sees. You just can't. I know we talked about it last week, but we're talking about it again this week. You cannot see what everybody else sees. We are not like everybody else. We are God's children. Oh, John and Carol were my parents, yes, but uh, parenting only lasts until you're out of the house. They're really, you know, we don't parent people after that. We try to encourage them. We, I'm not parenting. I don't take David out and spank him anymore. He needs it, but I don't do it, you know. Um, I don't, I, I'm not their parents per se. I'm not in the parenting mode now. I'm in the friend mode, the encouraging mode, the mentor mode, I hope. Yeah. It's different. And so, you know, we're, we're, we're not, we are not just, I'm not just John and Carol's son. 
You're not just your parents' child. You've been born again. You're in a different family now. It's called the family of God. And God is the Father. <laughs> and I'm supposed to be emulating Him. I'm supposed to be living His kind of life. Amen? And so as His child, I am in the world, but I'm not of the world anymore. I'm still in it. Uh, yes, I'm still identified as David Krausen, but I've got a different name written down in heaven. The Bible says when I get there, I'm going to get a new name that's written down in glory. Amen? And, and so I, I'm in the world, but I'm not of the world. I, 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 look like, I, I look like I belong here, but I don't belong here. I'm a pilgrim just passing through to get to my eternal home, which is with God. And so because of that, I don't see, I, I don't see like the world sees. We're not fact people anymore, F-A-C-T. We are faith people, F-A-I-T-H. We are faith people. We do not see through eyes of facts. We th see through eyes of faith. <laughs> Superman looked normal until his eyes turned orange and flames came out of him. Huh? That's how we are. We may look like we belong here, but we don't belong here. We've got something the world doesn't have. We've got faith in God, our Father, and we are supposed to exhibit not only His gifts and fruit, but we are supposed to exhibit His power. Yeah. But you shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you. And part of that is our faith. It's, it, it's put into action because we know who we are putting our faith in. I'm not putting faith in an axe head to float. Are you kidding me? Or to swim? I'm not putting faith in that metal to do something it wasn't built to do. I'm putting faith in God my Father who can make something that wasn't made to do it, do it. Yes. <laughs> Nehemiah, the Bible says in Nehemiah chapter 1, verse 3, they said unto me that the remnant that are left of the captivity there in the province are in great affliction and reproach. The wall of Jerusalem also is broken down, and the gates thereof are burned with fire. That hurts my heart because that's how we see our world today. Everything is falling apart. But when Nehemiah got there and he saw the wall and he saw the desperation of the people and he saw the beloved city of God in disarray, he, he, the Bible says he went out and he began to, began to cry out to God. And he said, our sins are ever before us and we have, we have allowed the sin of, of, of our sins to destroy your city. And he said, God, if you will, I will race it back up. Why? Because Nehemiah saw something that nobody else saw. They walked around and said, well, we've lost it all. We don't know what's going to happen now. That's why we walk around in despair. Our city's gone. We have no wall of protection. We have no place to live. This place is crumbling around. We're going to have to move and do something different. But Nehemiah said, no, this property belongs to God. And I see it as a successful, prosperous place and a blessed place. And he says, God, if you will help me, I will raise this place back up. You cannot see what everybody else sees. You've got to see what God wants you to see. God places dreams in us and visions in us because he wants you to see what he sees. I look back now and I think sometimes that's why my daddy told us the stories he told us and his, his brother and sister told us stories of him which just kind of reiter, reiterated to us and proved to us that what he was saying in our lives was true because if you met my dad, you'd say, well, you don't look like much. And of course, I'm not talking about when he's young. I'm talking about when he's older. He said, well, you just look like an old cowboy. I mean, well, he just had to see him when he was younger and just know that he just excelled past his own physical abilities. He, he wasn't the most muscular guy. He certainly wasn't the tallest guy. Um, but, um, but man, could he do stuff. And so he, would, he wouldn't speak to us about what he saw. He'd speak to what about, to us about what he saw. Not what he saw, it's what he saw. Right. Yeah. Nehemiah says, I'm not speaking about what I see. Yeah. I'm speaking about what I see. God, this is your city. Yeah. 
your city don't belong like this. Your city don't, this is your city. Your walls aren't supposed to be crumpling. Your people aren't supposed to be desperate. Your people are supposed to be blessed and prosperous. And this land is supposed to be beautiful. And this city wall should be the best around. And, and I'm going to, you just help me, God. You give me a plan and I'm going to do it. Mm. So don't, don't see what everybody else sees. And here's the deal. Resurrection begins at the source of life. The devil walks about as a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. He wants to steal, to kill, and to destroy. So anything that wants to live, it's because God's involved. Um, I don't know. Maybe we'll find out the facts. Well, we will find out the facts when we get to heaven. I don't know how much effect, you know, man is having on the planet. I don't know. But there's some people who believe that we're destroying the planet, you know, by, by too many cows passing gas and, you know, and all that stuff. And it's not, it's not really the, the jet that John Kerry's flying. That's not the problem. It's the cows. But um, <laughs> anyway, it's just utter foolishness but i think we are going to find out that some of it's true and uh you know i know that we it's amazing to me <laughs> this amazes me we have an asphalt somewhat asphalt driveway at our house got to be redone but we've we got somewhat of an asphalt driveway but it amazes me that over time dirt will form in the cracks of asphalt and where you can't put your finger you can't even get a tool in there, a plant will sprout up. Unbelievable. Because it comes not because man gave it an opportunity, but because God has put life in the seed, and all that seed needs is a little bit of dirt, a little bit of water, and a little bit of sunshine, and it's going to pop up. So when it comes to resurrection, it begins at the very source of life. John said this, chapter 6, verse 68, Then Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? Thou hast the words of eternal life, and we believe and are sure that, though, that thou art Christ, the Son of the living God. Where else can we go, Peter said. Where, that's what the old song says, Where could I go but to the Lord? There ain't nowhere else to go for life. Who's going to give you life? There, nobody controls life. I know, I know some of folks in charge in this world right now, they think they control life. That's why they're okay with killing babies and all this stuff because they can control life. And if you're old, they can just turn the machine off and you can just die because you're not worth anything. They think they control life. But I got news for you. They don't control life. And, and they, the, the, the one that controls life is the Lord Jesus Christ. He's the one that spoke this thing into existence. He's the one who, who came to give us life and more abundantly. He's just the opposite of the enemy of your soul. He came to do just the opposite of what the devil wants to do, which is take away your life, take away your family, take away your job, take away your church, take away your freedom. And God's over here saying, no, I want to give you freedom. I want to give you life. I want to encourage you. <laughs> I need somebody to agree with me for life. <laughs> this thing will live. This situation will live. Man, if I'm on my deathbed, I don't want no naysayers in my room. They got a, they got a theme at Phoenix First Assembly. I guess when you get big enough, you know, like Tommy Warnett's church and his following, you can get away with some things that I might not be able to get away with and say. But he says this around there. We don't want any naysayers and no joy suckers in here. He said at that meeting, but 3,000 preachers at that meeting, he said, if you're a naysayer or a joy sucker, you might as well get on out of here because we don't accept that around here. I don't want anybody speaking negative over me or my church. I don't want you griping about the carpet. Let me tell you all about the carpet. <laughs> he said what he did. He said, let me tell you all about the carpet. We, we bus a 1,000 children from the, Phoenix, the, the downtown area of Phoenix. We bus in 1,000 children children on Sunday morning that don't know a thing about church. So when you see the F word written on the walls of the bathroom, you just know that's the way it's going to be around here because we paint them weekly. But these kids come in and they're just, they're just rough kids. And, they, and you see that carpet? We change this carpet out in this church every three months. 
And I was like, wow. I mean, that carpet costs more than almost every church I've ever been in. I mean, it's huge. And I was like, man, you, you do that every three months? Yeah, because we, we got people trucking in and out of here, and they wear the carpet out. We use this building. So I don't need y'all telling me what don't look good around here or you don't like that word on the wall. I need somebody to just say, glory to God, we're bringing in the lost, and people are getting saved, and lives are being changed, and we're saving these kids from this awful environment they're being raised in, and we're bringing them into the kingdom of God, and God's going to establish them and raise them up as a new generation out of this city. Let me give you the last point. It's right on time. It's time to reach out of the tomb. <laughs> oh, Lord. <laughs> reach out of the tomb. <laughs> Second Kings chapter 6, verse 7 said that after he spoke over that axe head, he said, take it up to thee. And this little would-be prophet, it says, reached out his hand, and he took it. Anytime that we are dealing with God, there's going to be a part that God does, and there's going to be a part that will never happen if you don't move. Oh, my goodness. Y'all have no idea what it is to be a preacher. There are so many times I, I walk out of a pulpit. I've been in so many places and revivals and so many crowds of people where I preached and I walk away, there's always this feeling, I hope the one that was supposed to get that reached out and took it. Yes. And then when you find out they didn't, it grieves your heart. And you live with that grief. And you pray over those people. And you pray over that seed that you sowed in their life. Somebody's got to reach out and take it. John chapter 11, verse 44, talking about Lazarus, says, He that was dead came forth. Y'all know the story. Jesus looked at, looked at the situation, said, Roll the tomb away. They said, Well, he's been dead four days. He stinks. What do you want us to do about that? Don't worry about it. Just roll the stone out of the way. But, Lord, he stinketh. He said, Roll the stone out of the way. Just roll the stone out of the way. That's all you've got to do. Thank you. I'll let you preach next Sunday. No, I won't. Not next Sunday. No. Roll that stone out of the way. That was their part. That's the people that's gathered. That's the synergy. I need the synergy. Roll it. Move it. That's all you got to do. Now, Lazarus, it's your turn. He said, he called him forth. He was bound hand and foot. He had grave clothes on. Been, in other words, he's a mummy. He'd been wrapped up. He still smells like spices and that stuff. And his face was bound about with a napkin. Man, they done wrapped this dude up. I mean, he is a total mummy. He can't see. He can't move. He just wrapped up. And the Lord, this is good, man. And the Lord says, come out. Oh, this preaches all over me. Sometimes the opposition gets greater at the moment of the miracle. Yeah, that's like, wait a minute. You're asking me to do something that I can't do. You just called me out of a tomb. I'm wrapped up like a mummy. I can't even move my legs, and you want me to walk out of here? So y'all know how he came out. <laughs> and all those people around there went, oh, whoa, whoa. Yeah. Whoa. The dude is jumping. <laughs> Jesus said, come on, y'all. This is how Jesus preaches. Y'all just don't know it. He said, come on, y'all. What are y'all waiting on? Get the stuff off of him. The boy's trying to be free here. <laughs> That's your part now. You got to help the preacher. He's been set free. You got to help him a little bit. That's why preachers always stand in the pool and say, can y'all help me this morning? We're just trying to get the grave clothes off. Come on. Yeah. 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 Sometimes we need people to help us get it off. <laughs> That's why we call in other preachers to preach better than 
us. <laughs> come on in here, man. I've done all I can do. These people ain't got it yet. Will you come preach at my church? You got more people at your church than my church. Come on. Y'all notice I ain't had no dead preachers come. <laughs> I don't want no grave, man. <laughs> I don't want no mortician to come preach to my people. Get y'all ready to die. Put some stuff on y'all to help you lay down and be quick, be still, so we can wrap you up. Uh uh-uh. uh. I want somebody to res- I want somebody to resurrect the dead, man. I want somebody to say, get them clothes off of him. Let him loose. How do we bring this down to us? You gotta be, you gotta be like me this morning. You just gotta be like me. There's some things that the Lord has spoken in your heart. There's some things that maybe 30 years ago, I'm not talking about cars right now. I'm just that was a maybe that was a poor illustration. But maybe it'll get you thinking about some other things that are much more important in your life. There's some things, man, I've got some things that, that's in me. I've been at the highest of highs being the replacement speaker for John Kilpatrick at the height. I mean, at the very height of the Brownsville Revival. People drove for miles. One guy told me, this is what one couple told me before church that night. This is the naysayers. (laughs) I've just been told that morning. I get a phone call because I'm on the team. I'm preaching the morning services and, and I get this phone call, and it's the pastor. He says, man, something's come up. Pastor Kilpatrick cannot be here. Um, he, he can't get out of Florida right now. He just can't. He's got to be there. I need you to take his place. M- my first thought was, <laughs> really? <laughs> I mean, <come> on. <laughs> and so then my fear came to reality that evening. When people started to gather, I went to greet a per- I'll just say it that way, so a couple that we knew. They had driven... Oh, I would say they probably driven 150, 200 miles to get to that meeting. And they said, hey, we didn't know you were here. I said, yeah, actually, I'm preaching tonight. And I'll never forget the response of his wife. You're what? You're preaching tonight? I said, yeah, they didn't tell you. Pastor Kilpatrick had an emergency come up, family thing, and he's just got to be there for the family. It's a death in the family. And I, I, said, I said, yeah, they asked me to fill in. She said, you mean we drove all this way to hear John Kilpatrick and you're going to preach? And I, I didn't, I, I honestly, I, I, I didn't, I kind of felt their pain. I mean, you know, I felt the same way. I wanted to hear him preach too. But come on, y'all. It's not about the vessel. It's never about the vessel. It's about what's in the vessel. <laughs> all I know is, I got to tell you this because y'all know, y'all know, I, I shared this a little bit last month when, when uh, uh, Pastor Holt said about being at Brownsville and the little old lady praying for him. Well, that little old lady was Lila Terhune. Lila Terhune was the other speaker at that convention. There was three of us. And so I get to the front pew. Now, I just left this conversation. Now the crowd's gathering. And so, you know, uh, I just go back to my seat going, wow, this, wow, you know, okay, whatever. So I just kind of filed that in the naysayer joy sucker club, you know, and forget that. And I'm up there trying to encourage myself in prayer and looking over my limit. I only had like three notes for that night. I know y'all don't believe that, but it's the truth. It's just one of them nights that I just didn't have a bunch of notes. I just had a thought in my, I really, literally, it was dropped on me that morning, and I had one thought for the night, and that is the glory of God. That was my thought, the glory of God. I don't even, I did, that's all I had. And I, I was sitting on the front pew, and I was praying, and I was like, oh God, oh God, oh God. And Lila Terhune comes over and sits down next to me, and she says to me, I am so excited that you're preaching, and I can't wait to hear what you're going to say. Oh, God, (laughs) Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. I just remember thinking, I don't have a lot to say right now. I just got one thought. (laughs) 
But man, if I'm going to be encouraged, I want a Lila Terhune to encourage somebody who's been in revival for two years and has watched the glory of God. I'm going to talk about the glory of God. I want that lady next to me encouraging me. and pray. She said, I'll be praying for you while you're preaching. I'm like, yes, ma'am. Please pray. I mean, come on, y'all. That, that's like God just showed me. You got one over here that don't want it, don't believe it, don't know what's going to happen, and you got one that says, I can just see what God's it ain't about you. It's not about you. It's about God, and God's going to do something in this place. And hallelujah! <laughs> you say, well, pastor, you don't know the difficulties I've been through with this thing. You don't know what the, how the dream is falling apart. You don't know all the opposition. Well, I'm not talking about the opposition this morning. I'm talking about the one that's for you and with you and never leaves you and never forsakes you and makes a way where there doesn't seem to be a way and parts the waters and rains down manna out of heaven. Oh, we ran out of water. Well, it's going to come out of the rock. Well, we lost the axe head. Well, it's going to float. I mean, it's just all through your Bible. And so I know y'all are special. And y'all are at the walls of Jericho. And the walls of Jericho are literally wider and bigger and take up more space than the city that's within it. It's wide enough to race six chariots side by side on it. That's a six-lane highway, y'all. That's crazy. Around a city that only takes up a total of seven acres. It's, it's very small. But God says it's yours, and you're going to take it. So, Pastor, you don't understand. That's my situation. I got a wall that's bigger than the thing that God promised. But God doesn't look at the wall. God just talks about the promise. So we're not talking about the wall this morning. We're talking about the promise. We're talking about... God birthing something in you, the God of the universe who created the planet and everything that's alive on it. He's the one talking to you about your life and your situation. And when he speaks, the waters move and the winds blow. I mean, the opposition runs in fear. And by the way, Gideon, they're going to turn on themselves and kill each other before this is over. You won't need thousands of men. Just maybe 300 to make some noise. Huh? Yeah, all y'all going to do is just make noise. Y'all ain't killing nobody. Not until the battle's really over. I'll let you chase them down and kill the remnant, but no. No, I'm going to take care of the bulk of this. I just need you to believe. Oh, man. I just need you to believe with me. I just need you to believe with me. I just need you to believe with me. I need somebody to stand with me and say, I believe. I believe the Lord's report. I, I don't believe the report of the enemy. I I believe the report of the Lord. I sent out some spies and one for every tribe, and they came back, and they all were at the... They were all 12 at the same place at the same time, saw the same thing. But 10 of them saw, and two of them saw. Y'all with me? 10 of them saw, two of them saw what God saw. God saw his land. God saw their future. Ten of them saw the enemy. Two of them said, what enemy, huh? They were just like grasshoppers before our feet. Huh? They were ten, they were ten foot tall giants, which was an exaggeration, by the way. The tallest one that ever lived was nine foot six inches, so that, that was an exaggeration. Come on. Come on, y'all. We always exaggerate our problems. They made us look like little grasshoppers. No, they didn't. A six-foot man in front of a nine-foot giant, that's like me standing there, and the giant is as tall as just a little bit above that blue line. He don't make me look like a grasshopper. Now, I'm going to tell you, if he's my enemy, we got some serious praying to do, but what? That's a blue line. Y'all just see the negative. I see the positive. It's a blue line. I remember you doing it with a... Anyway, whatever. You taped it off and you painted the blue line. Let's be... Why y'all looking at the dark side of things? Wow. Wow. Now y'all know why I'm preaching this. This is my own family. Goodness. We're going to preach it again next week till you don't get it. Amen. Wow. 
You just don't know how big the wall is. We're not talking about the wall. We're talking about the promise of God in your life, the destiny God has for you. And I, this morning, I just want to tell you something, and I, I'm not going to name names, but I could. There, there were people, I mean this, there were, in, in my time this morning with the Lord, in finishing preparation for this, there were some of y'all that God showed me specifically, and the Lord said, see, there's, there's something in them. They have something a lot of people don't have, but they haven't tapped into it yet. It's there. I've made it available to them, but they haven't reached out of the tomb and grabbed it yet. And your job, preacher, is to go encourage them this morning that you're on the brink of something supernatural. Yeah. You're on the brink of a breakthrough, not just in your life, but in your family. Yeah. I'm talking about something that will revolutionize your life, revolutionize your family, change this church, yeah. because when God changes you, yeah. that means he He's changing this church. I'm just telling you. Y'all stand with me this morning. I pray for a spirit of revelation right now, God, to be poured out in this sanctuary. I pray, God, you begin to speak to our hearts right now. Some of us thought that we're just supposed to stand on the sidelines and watch it go, but no, we're supposed to be in the game. And you're calling us off the bench right now. Yeah. And you're reminding us that all those hours of practice, it really mattered. I was getting you ready for something that you didn't know was going to happen. Listen to this. Let me tell you how it happened. The Astros hit the bottom. You, you, if you don't remember this, it's crazy. They hit the very bottom. They were awful. And they said, well, we're just going to get rid of all these high paid players that it's not working for us we're spending money it's not working so we're going to get rid of all of them and they got rid of some great we had you remember we had joe morgan at one point for a second baseman i mean this is a legend right and they said at some point they said what are we going to do about second base they said all we have is this little kid down in triple a He's, he's, he's something else. He's kind of different. He's unorthodox. He's a really good second baseman. We don't know if he's ever going to be a great hitter. What do y'all think? Well, let's, what, what else? We, we, he's cheap. He ain't going to cost us nothing. We'll just bring up little Jose Altuve. And we'll stick him out. Man, it makes me want to cry. Because that's how I see myself. I see God saying, man, I'm just going to make an opening. And if you just step into the opening, man, I'll yeah. make you something you don't yeah. even know. You don't even know. Yeah. You don't know. You don't know. And they said, we'll just bring up the little Jose Altuve. And he'll just fill that space till we find us somebody who can play. Oh, man, were they wrong? Because when that kid hit the field, it wasn't but a matter of a, just a little bit. We, we all of a sudden, we had this awful team. If y'all remember these days, we had this awful team. I remember looking one time, and this is what it looked like. They put up the lineup, and this was the batting average. It's something like 227, 232, 214, 185. And then Jose Altuve, 314. Go west of them, 240, 230, 260. That means we had like two hitters on the whole team, and Jose Altuve was head and shoulders at about four foot nine, he was head and shoulders above everybody else on the team. And that has been that way ever since. I'm just telling you, what God will do is God will make things so bad that there's gonna be a space open up for somebody who's been sitting yeah. on a bench and God is saying, I just wanna bring you in there and I wanna empower you and gift you and increase you.
If you got, man, listen, God's been speaking to you while I've been preaching. There's a dream inside of you that has been sitting dormant. It, we drove down to Kima, met a guy that looked like he didn't own anything. He looked like he's homeless. I'm not exaggerating. My wife, she was scared. We drove down in a dark neighborhood. And this dude is sitting outside with his pit bull. Y'all getting the picture? He's sitting out with his pit bull in some raggedy old clothes, greasy, dirty, scraggly looking hair. Looked like he just come out from underneath the bridge. And my wife says, oh my Lord, surely we're not getting out here. I said, well, you can stay in the car. I'm getting out. I'm, 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 I'm in search of a dream. I ain't looking at that boy. I ain't worried about his dog. I want to see this car. It got worse. I said, hey, where's the car? The car's not here. My heart sank. I thought, oh, it's one of them deals. Okay, where's the car at? Well, the car is just about a mile down the road. You'll have to follow me. He goes over and gets in an old beat up Dodge truck that I didn't even think was gonna crank. I mean, it looks like it came out of a junkyard. His dog runs under the house and he backs out and we follow him. She says, where are we going? I said, I don't know. She said, David, seriously? I said, I don't know. He said, we're gonna go down there in about a mile. And so we drive and we turn, we make one turn and the sign says, dead end. Y'all seen that movie? Okay. And we drive down into what looks like a jungle, man. It's just woods. And the place we stop, we stop. There's nothing where we stop. He pulls off the side of the road and stops at a ditch. He just pulls off on the side of the ditch. She said, what's he doing? I said, I don't know what he's doing. Guy gets out. I pull up behind him. I get out. She said, I said, just stay in the truck. It's fine. So I get out of the truck. Hey, dude, where is the car? Because I'm getting a little concerned now because she's, she's kind of speaking fear into me. <laughs> and I don't have a gun with me, okay? And I'm not the most athletic. Anyway, anyway. So... I said, where is the car? He said, it's right over there. All I see is grass growed up. And I'm, I, my thought was, oh my word. I know what I'm fixing to see. I'm going to see a rusted out piece of trash that you lied about because he told me it had zero rust on it, which to me is a miracle because I've been looking for 30 years for one without rust and it just don't exist. And I'm thinking, oh my Lord, we went on a wild goose chase. I've driven two hours down here and I don't even see a car. It's buried in the grass. Probably been there for years. It's a piece of trash. I said, where is the car? He says, right there. I said, okay, well, take me to it because I don't see no car. We walk through the, we make a trail through the high grass. I'm thinking snakes and death and that kind of thing. Well, I didn't realize he was pointing to the other side of the row of bushes at the fence line on the other side is an old enclosed race car trailer. He said, the car's in there. I felt better. When he opened the door, I couldn't even believe it. Spider webs all over that thing. I didn't care, Mark. I whipped, I whipped those spider webs out of the way and crawled in there to verify a few things that I knew would be key signs if it was clean. Oh my goodness, it was clean and clean and clean and I couldn't find anything wrong with it and I was trying to. Can, can you, could you let that happen in your heart this morning? Let that happen. Don't, don't look at the spider webs. Don't look at the situation. Look at the dream inside your heart. What has God spoken about you? What is what when, when the preacher preaches, what is it that rises up in you? What does God say to you? Because I hear my daddy standing at the fence saying, you can hit the curveball, baby. Just go out there and swing the bat. Don't be afraid. You can do it. Do you hear the Lord speaking over your life today? Let him work. Reach out of the tomb and grab him. Grab his words. Grab his heart. And let him pull you out if he has to. Get somebody to help you get the grave clothes off. But just grab a hold of what God has for you this morning. So be bold. If God's speaking to you, get out of your pew. Come down here. I want to pray words of encouragement. I'm going to speak over you words of encouragement this morning. I'm going to practice what I'm preaching today. You come. You let me speak over you. Because it ain't going to be negative. It's going to be positive. I'm just telling you. It's going to be powerful this morning. It's going to be powerful this morning.
this morning. Come on, come on. Sing something, David. We're going to wait, wait just a minute. Let the Holy Ghost work. blessings but that's another story but what I'm telling you is he treats us all the same you're not you're not like more special than somebody else he'll 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 bless you remember Gideon believed just the opposite Gideon said I'm the least among my people and my family's the least among our people so in other words you don't do for me and God says so so I'm gonna bless you I'm gonna use you because God's not a respecter of persons okay so that's number one God's not a respecter of persons. But, and, and so God, uh, this is just what God spoke to me this morning. So God literally puts the handfuls on purpose that he did for Ruth. He puts them in front of every one of us. Uh, you don't know me, Pastor, or nothing good ever happens to me. Well, that's, well you just keep speaking that. But I'm just going to tell you the facts of the Word of God. Everybody has handfuls on purpose that are laid in their row. Yeah, that's right. Now, if you ever heard this preached, you know, if Ruth would have got out of her row, there wasn't anything in the other rows. Nothing. Nothing. Empty. But in her row, it was set up by God. Yeah. 
So if you're not in your row, then don't blame God for not getting you blessing. Don't, don't blame God for not doing what he says he's going to do. You're just in the wrong row. Okay? Now here's the next part. So God's not a respecter of persons. And what God does for one, he does for another. God's put handfuls on purpose in your life. But what the Lord showed me this morning is we just walk by them and don't pick them up. We just don't pick them up. I get this taught to me on a regular basis by God. God puts things in my row all the time, but 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 I've been taught by my father that you got to reach out and grab it. And I don't always even have the support of my wife in this sometimes because she don't see things, certain things like I see them. And I'll say, hey, I'm going to buy this so-and-so. And she'll say, why? I'll say, because I'm going to make money on it. God laid it in my row. Well, we don't have the money. Yep, but it don't matter about the money. I'm not looking at the money. I'm looking at the future of this. I'm going to buy it, and everybody in my family is going to grab because it's sitting in my driveway. But then when I sell it and make it $1,000, everybody's going, oh, wow. Happens every time. Every time. It's the same pattern every time. Oh, Dad, why'd you buy that? Oh, honey, why'd you buy that? Because I, because God put it in my row, and I'm going to make money on it. You watch and see. Happens all the time. I'm just teaching my son something. My neighbor just gave us a bunch of furniture. It's not much count, but let me just tell you something. There's a lot of people that need cheap furniture. We see it all the time. He said, why are we loading this up, Dad? It's, it's not worth getting. I said, because I'm going to sell it and make money on it. You watch and see. So God's going to teach him something. You be the naysayer. I'm going to be the faith guy. And y'all call me a hoarder, and I'm going to keep making money. David Patrick's with me. He, he's with me. Thank you. Thank you for believing with me. Yeah. Happens over and over and over. Now listen to me. If God puts something in your path, it ain't God's fault if you don't pick it up. My wife's supposed to be a millionaire, but when she when God birthed in her the idea of a curic, she passed on it. I'm telling y'all, that's the honest to God facts. That, that's what happened. He showed her how to make up one cup of coffee and save the money because she's frugal. And so God showed her 30 years ago how to make a cup of coffee for her and my mom without wasting a pot of coffee. And if she would have acted on that, wow, I guess we'd be billionaires today. And maybe we didn't, it didn't happen because God knew I wouldn't be good with that much money, so he didn't let it happen. I don't know. I'm just telling you, it was there for the taking, Dave. And I just wonder, how many times have we walked by the handful on purpose that God just laid down and we never picked it up? We did not pick it up. We didn't pick it up. Today, let today, let today be a change in your heart and a change in your focus so that you begin to walk in the idea and the belief that God is going to bless me, God's going to make a difference in me, I'm going to not pass on it, I'm going to grab a hold of it, it may take some work, I may have to get some help to get the grave clothes off, but I'm going to come out of this too. I'm going to walk in another way, I'm going to be blessed. If everybody else is making money, I'm going to be making money. If everybody else is being successful, I'm going to be successful because God is no respecter of persons. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Now listen to me. If you can believe, I want you to come stand behind these folks up here. If you can believe with me, if you, you know, if you believe. And I want you to pray faith right now. Just believe. Just pray faith right now. Father, in the name of Jesus, Lord, I thank you, God. I thank you, God, that you have been sowing seed in our hearts. And it's been growing. We've been nurturing it. We've been watering it. We've been believing God, we're coming into harvest time. It's about to pop through the ground. That asphalt might be putting some stress on it, but it's about to pop up in a place where nobody thought it was possible. They didn't think it was possible, but it is possible. It can grow right there. It can grow right there. It's possible. And with you, God, it's more than possible. It's probable. It's going to happen. As Don Gibby said, it's a done deal, God. We're just, we're just ready to see it happen. Hallelujah. We curse every naysayer, every doubt network, the 
we throw it off to the side. We don't listen to those words. We're listening to the word of our God, our Father. Hallelujah. You've stored up for us. The Bible says the wealth of the wicked is even laid up for the just. Some old wicked person's been working, making money, and it's fixing to be ours. Hallelujah. Because you've been storing it up for us. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We're not going to leave Egypt empty-handed.
made up of all kinds of people. And majorly, there are, there are people that are negative and there are people that are positive. And that happens within the kingdom of God as well. And, you know, it doesn't mean you're not a Christian. It just mean, it means that you had not got a grip on that part of your life yet. You know, being, being, speaking faith, you maybe, you know, for whatever reason, maybe you been raised by people that don't know how to speak faith. You're learning your, we're all on a different level in our walk with God. So I'm not saying you're not saved if you, if that's the kind of person they are. I'm just saying there's that kind of people. What I am going to say to you is this. As a child of God and a person who's supposed to be an encourager, God will put people in your path. It's going to happen. that are going to be negative, naysayer, doubters cursors if you will they're going to speak things over your life that are not right they're not godly they're they're negative in nature they come from a place that god doesn't want them to come from it is not our job to conform to the ways of the world no. romans chapter 12 it is our job to impress the world if you will with the nature of God that's in us. So when things come against us that are negative, and ne sometimes people don't even know they're doing it. It's just the way they talk. They don't mean it. They're not trying to be destructive in your life. I'm not saying that at all. It just doesn't make it right. Ignorance doesn't make something right. And so our job in those moments is to bring, we are supposed to bring reproof to the world. So when people say things that shouldn't be said it's not time for us to react in emotion it's not time to react in emotion it is time to act like the children of God were supposed to be and correct the moment somebody speaks over you and say oh you'll never be much that's because your family was never much you just say well I, yeah but I'm in a new family now if my family ain't much, if it's just what you think, that don't matter. Because the family I'm in now, my father's a pretty big deal. He's God. I got saved. I've been born again. I'm in a new family. Right? I'm not, I say, uh, you, you know, well, you 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 came from, like, y'all heard Brother Summers when he's preached for us. He and I grew up in Channel View, and Channel View wasn't ever, nobody ever knew what it was until Jalen Hurst came along. Now, now we know Jalen Hurts. Now we know, you know, because he's on TV playing football. But but other than that, nobody even knew Channel View existed. And it, it, he'll say, you know, he'll he'll kind of quote that scripture and put Channel View in. Did anything good come out of Channel View? It can when you're in the right family. Because we got, I'm not in the... I'm in the world, but I'm not of the world anymore. I got reborn. And I'm in a new family. My DNA changed. There's ways to address things so people aren't offended. How many of y'all know we're not supposed to repay an offense with an offense? I'm just preaching to myself right now. Okay. You're not supposed to lash back with an offensive religious reaction to, how dare you? I'm a man of God. No, you're not. Not in that moment, you ain't. You ain't acting like God at all. <laughs> no, that's not. Uh -uh. No, we don't repay an offense for offense. We, we speak life into a dead moment. Hmm? And on the job, at the house, wherever, we, we reprove each other all the time. That's what good relationships do. When she says things she ain't supposed to say, I'll say, you shouldn't have said that. That wasn't right. And then about 10 times a day, she'll say to me, you weren't supposed to say that. Okay, you're right. You're right, because we're trying to reprove one another. I got a lot to work on with her. Y'all just don't know. Oh, I mean, she's got a lot to work on, yeah. <laughs> that's, that's what you do. And so if you really love people, then God's going to put some people in your life and some situations in your life. Maybe somebody you don't even know. You just have a moment of transaction with them at a business or somewhere. You just, you know, it's just a happening happens and a moment happens. That's our moment to bring life to a dead situation. 
make sure we choose our words wisely. Take a moment. I've been doing that a lot. I have to do that a lot, man, because I'm a talker and I'm, I'm easy to talk. And so I have to catch myself and say, wait, whoa, 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 don't talk, don't talk, don't talk, don't talk. Just listen, listen, listen. And then I listen to the Holy Spirit and say, okay, God, what do you want to say? <sighs> okay, now I can respond so that I don't react, but I act in a, in a God-like way and say the right thing in a bad moment. Sometimes, you know, the doctor makes a declaration over you. Just take a couple deep breaths. Don't respond to it. And let the faith arise. And then you speak a faith thing right behind that. He says, you know, you got this or that. You just say, okay, well, I understand what the report says, but I'm not a fact person. I'm a faith person. So I'm just going to believe the report of the Lord. And the report of the Lord says I'm healed. So, Doc, what do we need to do to get through this? Because I'm going to get through it. I'm just telling you, I'm going to get through it. I'm not, no, I'm not going to die from it. No, no. Don't care what the, I don't care what the blood report says. I don't care what the... Uh-uh. We're going to get through this. You're going to speak life into a dead situation. That's how you do it. That's how you do it. Amen? Amen. Amen. Woo! Feels like Easter Sunday morning. <laughs> I like this resurrection subject. It's good. Amen. Uh, four o'clock today at our house... Uh, we have two chefs that we have hired to prepare for you fish and shrimp. It's not going to cost you a thing. Um, if you look on their faces, they paid the price for it yesterday. They're sunburned and tired and wore out, but they got us fish and, and shrimp. I don't know where they got the shrimp. I'm sure it was hard to get in the lake, but anyway, they got it. And uh, So 4 o'clock at our house, come over there gonna have all the fixings it's gonna be great sun's out y'all can sit in the lawn chairs in the backyard and smell the fish fry amen everybody's invited everybody's invited and if you want to bring somebody bring them amen i'll give them my portion they can have it amen i invited my neighbor over yesterday who really likes to eat and i have never seen him at anything but i said hey we're having a fish fry tomorrow why don't you if y'all gonna be over here work why don't y'all come he said Y'all, y'all give us a plate of food. I said, Dave, we'll hook you up with fish and shrimp. It's gonna be all. He said, Okay, okay. Well, if, I, if I'm over here, we'll, we'll come. I don't know if I'm here. If I'm here, we're gonna come over and eat. I said, Okay. Y'all come on and eat. We'll feed you. Amen. So invite somebody. Amen. Uh, by the way, uh, two two Sundays from now, uh, not next week, but the following week's Easter Sunday, we are going to have our regularly scheduled revival service Easter Sunday night. Um, Nobody hunts Easter eggs on Sunday night, so don't come to me and say you're messing up my Easter egg hunt. That, that, no, you don't take your kids out in the yard in the dark. So okay, so we're gonna have church, and it's gonna be awesome. I'm just telling you, it's gonna be awesome. You should, you should have been here Wednesday night to hear the word of the Lord that came forth Wednesday night it, it, about Easter Sunday. All I tell you, you need to be excited about Easter Sunday. It's gonna be a great day, and uh, I believe the Lord's gonna do some great things in the, those two services on Sunday, Easter Sunday. So make plans to be there and invite somebody. Invite someone to come and uh, be a part of what God's doing. Amen? Well, let me bless you. Hallelujah. <laughs> Hallelujah. Father, we do this every week, and it just seems like it builds and builds and builds. Word of God says, if we would hearken to your voice and obey and do your commandments, that all these blessings would come upon us. You bless us in our bodies, in our spirits, on our jobs, in our businesses and careers, when we work, when we play, when we come in the door and go out the door from the north, the south, the east, and the west, we'd be overtaken by the blessings of the Lord. And you went so far as to say you'd bless everything that we put our hands to. If we would hearken to your voice.